From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Phew, you finally got everything into the ground, transplanting every little seedling and sowing every seed, and it's time to sit back and pat yourself on the shoulder. Or is it? Sorry, gardeners, especially when it comes to plants we grow as annuals, like most of our vegetables and cutting and container flowers, once is not enough. Today's subject is succession sowings, which to do and when and how, and our guest is Nikki Jabour. But first, these messages. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. Nikki Jabour, a resident of Halifax, Nova Scotia, is an award-winning author and popular lecturer who also hosts the Weekend Gardener radio show. Her recent book, Veggie Garden Remix, Celebrating Unusual Edibles We Can and Should Grow, just won a 2019 American Horticultural Society Book Award. Congratulations and welcome, Nikki. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that was pretty cool that you won that big, big prize in garden writing. It was it was very surprising because it was completely off my radar, and uh, <laughs> I got a call from my editor, and she was super excited. I honestly I couldn't believe it. I was I was so excited, so happy, and when you put all that work and love into a project, you really hope other people are going to like yes. it too, and you don't always know. So this was really validating for me. Yes, well, I I'm um, I was definitely impressed, and it was it was well deserved because it was a different take it wasn't just another vegetable gardening book by any means so well, you thank you that was yeah. the whole, that was my whole goal um, yeah. just to celebrate some of these really oddball unique awesome vegetables we can and should grow in our gardens but m- many of us just haven't really discovered yet right. so that was the point yeah so so succession sowing and you know that sense like i said in the introduction you know you feel like oh i've done it i'm done it's everything's full all the spaces are taken up and then it's like um guess what? <laughs> so. That's exactly what it is. Like, I mean, we all say, let's get the garden in. And once the garden's in, well, you wait, you harvest, you eat, and then that's it. But it doesn't have to be, I think, is the whole point of succession planting. Right. And I mean, so many things. And, and one, of, you know, there's some that are just like questions. And you as a garden writer, or garden communicator, have probably been asked a million times. You know, there's certain things, and it can be herbs as well, you know, like cilantro. People are like, well, you know, I tried cilantro, but then it was like flowering and it was all gone. And, you know, there's things like that that you just absolutely positively have to redo every 10 days or two weeks or whatever to have a constant supply. And then there's other things like tomatoes and eggplants and peppers that in our northern climates maybe we only do once, of course, right? So there's extremes. Are there extremes, do you think? Absolutely. And, and I think a lot of people will plant something like cilantro and it goes to flower within a couple of weeks and they're like, oh, I didn't do it right. You know, maybe right. I should do that again. Maybe they didn't understand that it's a cool season crop and, it, you know, it likes its cool, moist soil in the cool season. Um, and it's not their fault. They did nothing wrong. Uh, but it is one of those vegetables, those herbs, like you say, that you have to plant often if you want that continual supply. Or then you have your long season crops, like, the, as you mentioned, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. You plant once generally and they stay in the garden all summer and you have a great harvest. Um, you know, and then maybe at the end of the summer they can come out and you can put something else in there as a successive crop. But generally, they're in there in their spot for the whole entire season. Now, do you make a calendar of this or is this in your head because you're <laughs> like a veggie garden, four-season gardener, even though you're in Halifax, Nova Scotia? You're like, you're, because you, don't you even have like, uh, you have cold frames and do you have a hoop house now too? I'm, I'm making that up, or you have a no? I do. I have I have a, uh, a hoop house. It's 14 by 24 feet. I use cold frames. I use just simple mulching for harvesting all winter for a lot of root crops. Right. I use mini hoop tunnels that I make, sort of like little baby little hoop houses. I make those from like PVC or metal conduit covered with like just plastic. So I use a lot of different devices to harvest all season long. And I am in Zone Five, so I'm um, in Nova Scotia, which is about I guess a 12 hour drive north of New York City. So I'm I'm pretty northern, really. Mm-hmm. And so you ha- you are really taking succession sowing to an extreme of extreme extremes. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, you know, growing up with a vegetable garden, you know, and that's kind of what got me started when I was a kid. It really sparked that interest for me in not only eating more vegetables, but growing some. Um, you know, we never succession planted. So you'd plant your bush beans and your peas and your tomatoes and your carrots. And once something was harvested, that you know, row in the garden was left empty for the entire rest of the summer and right. fall. And that was it. I had no idea I could have probably succession planted those areas. And you know, sometimes I, I have little contests with myself. I'll have a, a bed in the garden and I have 20 raised beds in my veggie garden. And I'll be like, I wonder how many crops I can get from this bed. You know, so you can start with some super early greens, you know, follow that up maybe with some radishes or turnips, and then you go to, like, uh, baby peas, some, you know, or baby carrots, and you go to some of the, like, bush beans, and then I'll follow that up with broccoli for fall and, you know, uh, greens for winter. So I've, I think my record is eight crops in one bed oh, over the course goodness. of the year. <laughs> but that, that might be a little extreme. <laughs> so when I see farmer friends, organic farmer friends, who have their kind of bed plans, um, you know, they'll – often have like four columns, say, in them. And and not that every bed's used four times, but and one one sowing may be a cover crop for part of the year when the bed is fallow and, you know, to build the soil and stuff like that. So it's not just constantly pumping stuff out. But frequently I'll see several as and I think several's a realistic goal for home gardeners, don't you think? Like Oh yes. I would say at least two or three yes. uh, over the course of the season. And I, I do try to put it on paper. I have excellent intentions. How's that um, going? Pretty good? <laughs> I'd like to say yes. I should say yes to you. But, you know, I, I, I get busy like everybody else. And so I'll start off with these wonderful little charts. And then nature happens. You know, I'll be up in the garden. I'll see a little space. I'm like, oh, I'm going to shove in, you know, a couple parsley plants here. I'm yeah. going to stick some bush bean seeds in. So then all my well-laid plants just kind of go out the window. And, I mean, the key for me is keep planting and don't let any open space remain in the garden. So those are the two things I keep in mind, and then I just fill that space. So to do so, we have to have, even if we don't make a perfect calendar, we have to have some our gear kind of ready, and we have to have either a succession of seedlings coming, hard to find at the garden center where I live after May or even or early June. There are no more tender young seedlings of broccoli or kale or whatever to plug in. So I've got a plan for that myself. So what's sort of the the basics that we need to think about, regardless of what crop it is, that, that we need okay. to have on hand? Well, for me, I mean, succession planting, you know, there's different ways to look at it, first mm-hmm. of all. So you, you can have it one plant following another, Um, you know, so you've got something in there, like, uh, again, you've got spring peas, they come out, you put bush beans in for summer, you know, pull those out, put in beets for fall. So you can succession plant that way. You can also succession plant by planting, you know, the same crop, but as you mentioned earlier on, you know, spacing it out every three or four weeks, you can put some fresh seed in. And this works great for things like the cilantro, as well as salad greens, bush beans, radishes, really fast-growing crops. Um, but you don't want a whole lot of at one time. And then you can also plant the same vegetable at the same time, but different varieties that have different maturity dates. So this is another easy way to, success, to, to succession plant. I will plant something like maybe mochum carrots that are ready in 50 days. And then at the same time, I'll plant purple haze carrots that take 70, 75 days. Right. So even though I'm planting at the same time, I'm going to be harvesting at different times. So it kind of depends on the space you have. Like, do you have enough room to do that? Or is it easier to follow one crop with another? So there's different ways to succession plant. Um, But you're right. You know, when I'm thinking of summer and fall and even winter harvesting, my garden centers, you know, by early July, they don't have any transplants left. And so, you know, to make sure you have that parade of plug-in plants, I like to call them, you can use your grow lights. Grow lights, to me, are one of the handiest tools, and they're pretty inexpensive. I have very cheap shop light fixtures that cost me $20, fit it with fluorescent tubes that I change every two years, and they're hung on chains in my, you know, unfinished part of my unfinished basement. Mm-hmm. So it works great for me. You must use sh- you, uh, grow lights all the time as well. I do. I mean, I have, I, I maybe, I don't know, five, six, however many years ago, I invested in the T5 fluorescent tubes. They're narrower yeah. and they have a higher output of light. Um, but... But, you know, so that's good. But I've also, I'll confess that sometimes, 
you know, if I've put it away and I – or I just have like one light hood still out and not all – you know, maybe I'll have several out in the winter when I – or late winter when I'm doing stuff for spring planting. Um, you know, and I don't have enough space. I mean, sometimes I'll just do them in small um, community pots, you know, or a flat or a cell pack or whatever. And I'll keep an eye on it. I'll keep it near the house. I mean, I'm not going to put it out in the middle of the backyard all by itself, the poor little creature, you know, this th- these sown seeds or whatever, and forget to water it and so on. But sometimes I just do it near to the house, like a little space, um, you know, where I might have a flat going and I might have a six pack of this, that, and the other thing in that one flat. And so every day I'm passing it and thinking, oh, I'm going to water that. So I'm using natural light outdoors is what I'm saying. I also do that sometimes. But you have to remember to water it because if seeds, when they're germinating, dry out, they die. Yeah, and (laughs) if you're doing it outside, I would definitely start them in shade so they don't dry out as quickly. Exactly. Once once they germinate, move them into the the light. Yeah. Um, And and that works great. I just find where I have an obsessive amount of beds, I need to produce quite a few plug-in plants. So I I do use – I don't use my whole grow lights because I have eight grow lights in my basement. Um, on shelving, but I do end up using, I usually have two on. Once that initial spring rush goes in the garden, I usually keep two turned on, and I always have three or four flats coming along underneath. And sometimes, you know, I'll find I have extra plants to share with other people as well, but generally um, I'll use up all those plants as as I plug them into empty spots in the garden. So, so you, you kind of alluded to some of the kind of fast growing vegetables that you succession plant sort of taking off on, I had mentioned the cilantro, the herb, and you mentioned like greens and so forth. So let's talk about some of the ones that you would recommend that people, like in the old books it used to say, plant a short row of dot, 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 you know, and it'd be for like lettuce or bush beans. It, it, would, it would be implying don't put 20 feet of it if you're a one or two or even four-person households, <laughs> you know, right. do do a little a block. You know, there was this sort of square foot gardening. You know, you do a block or you could do a short row. How, what are the things that you do over and over and over again? Do you know what I mean? Every couple of weeks or every three weeks? What are your things like that? I think it depends on what your family and what you like to eat. But mm-hmm. I call my I, I plant in mini bands. I like to call them because my beds are about four feet. In the polytunnel, they're three feet across. And then they're, um, well, in the garden, they're, you know, either four by eight or four by ten. So I plant in these bands that are about, well, the width of the bed, four feet, yes. by about a foot to two feet, depending on how much of the vegetable I want at one time. And I'm constantly sowing these mini bands. And for me, it's like arugula. I cannot get enough of it. So yes. I always, every day of the year, we have arugula in the garden to harvest. Um, you know, so I'm planting mini bands of it every two or three weeks. So there's always high quality arugula. I mean, if I planted a 20-foot row or even a five or ten-foot row, that's going to produce maybe a little too much. And it's not one of those crops that's going to hold until I harvest it. it you know, it, it really only lasts for two or three weeks in the garden as, as in terms of high quality. And then it starts to bolt, starts to get more bitter. Um, and that happens, of course, to lots of different greens and vegetables. So I want to maintain the high quality harvest. And that's what succession planting lets me do. So planting my mini bands every so often is the best way to do that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, so arugula, pak choy, I usually always have going. Different types of spinaches are big for me. I love, I'm kind of obsessed right now with lettuce. I mean, it's easy. There's so many varieties. But I've been growing the Salanova lettuces, which are newer cultivars, and they're these perfect miniature rosettes of red, greens, you know, some are more perfect rounded rosettes, some are more oak leaf types, but I love them because they're also really cold tolerant. So we had those all winter long in the polytunnel, like on heat at polytunnel in the cold frames, and they were amazing. Um, so those are some of my go-tos for really fast growing things that you would only sow a little bit of a time, but even like radishes, um, you know, uh, things like kohlrabi. Uh, bush beans, baby beets, those little tiny finger carrots or the round carrots. These are all really fast growing. So these would be the ones that I tend to rotate quite a bit. How many times do you, for instance, think you sow bush beans? Because I tend to, I think I do like two plus a pole beans sowing, maybe three, but usually, well, maybe three plus a pole beans sowing. And, you know, so I always have beans, I mean, from the first time I possibly can until the very last bit of, you know, until it freezes. Yeah, I think I'm the same, actually. Yeah. Um, probably three or four of bush beans. And then, you know, I try to do two pole beans. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, they, they do produce for a much longer period, six to eight weeks. Yes. Which is bush beans, which are maybe two to three. Um, so I, I do try to stagger my pole beans about a month apart and then bush beans every two to three weeks. Do and you, I do push yeah. it sometimes. You know, sometimes right. there's been a few years when they, 
you know, we had an early frost unexpectedly and it didn't work out. But generally it does, and I'm willing to take that chance for sure. You know, I, I, a couple of years ago I started growing provider bush beans. Do you have ever grown provider? I have, yes. Yeah, it's a good name because it does give you, I, I feel like it even gives you several pickings. Do you know what I mean? It really just keeps yep. providing. So, um, and that brings up the subject of varieties. So you, you alluded to this a little bit when you talked about you might sow two different carrots, but yep. with like lettuces and so forth, um, things that maybe don't want to bump into the heat, there are some that are more or less tolerant. And when uh, when we're a little farther into the cycle, not my first spring sowing, but farther on, I'm thinking especially the late ones that might be bumping into either heat or then the ones that are going to be bumping into fall cold. <laughs> I might be exactly. changing up the varieties. So do you also, when you order seeds, think about this? this succession? I do. And I mean, I order so many seeds. <laughs> Oops. You know, spring is a, is a time when I just order constant seeds. And I always um, want to try new varieties, new to me, vegetables as well as, of course, the varieties. So I'm always looking for that. Like this year, I think um, I have way too many cucumbers. I, have, I just seeded them a couple days ago, and I, I think I have 22 varieties at this point, which is far more cucumbers than a sane person needs. Did, did, wait, did but you just say 22? I did. did you're not 2.2. No, 22 varieties. Uh -huh. That's um, really, that's kind of nuts. <laughs> it's excessive, I know, right? But um, last year I did this thing where I layered uh, aged manure and straw at the very end of my garden, and I just tucked in a bunch of cucumber seedlings there and let them do their thing, and they went crazy. So it's sort of a low-maintenance spot for me. Uh -huh. um, but then I'm also growing some greenhouse varieties in the polytunnel, so I wanted to try uh, quite a few. Like, I won't grow five or six of each type. I'll grow one or two of each type. I see. Um, you know, but there's a new one I'm really kind of fascinated with called Quark. And it's this miniature, tiny little mini cucumber that's maybe two inches long, but it's half white and half green. So it's like these dual colors, which is cool. And then there's one called Itachi, which is this pure white Asian um, cucumber. So it's really long and slender, but the skin is pure white, the inside is pure white. And it just, it's so interesting and unique to me that these are the things I, I tend to to want to try growing. So. Right. I order way too many seeds, and I do try to think about that. I should have some heat-tolerant lettuces on hand. I should have some cold-tolerant lettuces on hand. Um, so it, it is nice to make lists and stay organized because when I place my orders in spring, early spring, late winter, I don't want to have to do it again in summer if I realize, oh, no, I want a succession plant, more winter lettuce. I don't have any. I have to place an order. So I try to stay on top of that so I save shipping charges. Living on the east coast of Canada, usually shipping tends to be kind of expensive for a lot of seed companies. So I, I try to organize myself so that I, I think about all that when I'm placing my main orders. Right. Um, flowers, do you do this with flowers too? I, I, a friend, a neighbor who's an organic flower farmer, uh, we were recently chatting and she was talking about doing like four sowings of a lot of her annual flowers because she needs to have, again, you know, high quality, you know, it's not, it can't be anything but perfect. And those yeah. zinnias she sowed in May or April are not going to be that way if they even are producing come, you know, August, September. So she yeah. does a lot of successions of most all her annual uh, flowers. Yeah. And I learned this from a flower farming friend, actually. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, just because I didn't realize you could succession plant your, your zinnias. Again, I'm a short season region, and we always just plant zinnias. And I have loads of flowers in my vegetable garden, mostly to attract the beneficial insects and the pollinators, but also because I do want to you know, cut continuously. And I also think they look fantastic, so I add lots of flowers. Zinnias, sunflowers are my favorites. Um, but as you know, like zinnias, they, after they start blooming for three or four weeks, they produce fewer blooms and smaller blooms. So if you want those big blooms, I will tuck transplants in the garden, you know, once the frost date is passed. At the same time, I will direct sow some seeds. And so I can do that all at the same time, so I don't have to, you know, repeat myself a couple weeks later. Or I could start those seeds indoors for transplants and then plant them in the garden in a month. But you can, at that point, I usually just direct sow, and that way I have my first crop followed by a second crop. And in a home garden, I think that's enough. If I was a serious flower farmer, right. I would probably do three, maybe even four. Yes. Um, yes. And as you know, sunflowers, too. Some only produce one flower per stem. So if you plant those and then you get your flower, it's done. Some are multi-branching. So if you want the one flower per stem types, which tend to be the highest quality for cutting, then you're going to want to make sure you do at least two or three successive plantings of those, probably three weeks apart, starting, you know, once that last frost has passed. So if we want to get more and more and more out of our beds, you said you have how many? 20 beds? Do you have 20 beds? How many? 20 plus a bunch of yeah. straw so, combo beds. But if you want to, you know, if you're setting yourself wild goals um, to get multiple turns out of each one, multiple different crops out of each one, 
we don't want to exhaust our soil. So what's the strategy there to also have that like one of the successions, and I mentioned this before, like uh, some farmer friends will have a cover crop as one of their successions, like right on their charts, you know, th when, the, when that bed's going to be growing a green manure to be turned under or something. But what's your sort of strategy to care for the soil so that it can hold up to this demand that you're placing? Yeah. And I think that's so important. I mean, you know uh, uh, that, I mean, soil is key. Healthy soil makes healthy plants. And if your soil is struggling, your plants are going to struggle. Struggling plants attract, you know, insect pests. They are more susceptible to diseases. So you definitely want to start with a really healthy soil. Um, actually, just before I came in, I, I took a break from writing, and I went out and worked some aged manure into my beds right now. So I've got dirty fingernails, and I'm feeling the sunshine on my face, and it was amazing. Um, you know, so between my successive crops, I do add um, some either my own ho homemade compost, maybe some leaf mold, or some aged manure. I don't add as much as I would in the first crop in spring. I uh -huh. usually dig an inch or two into each bed at that point. But I will add maybe half an inch or so to each bed between successive crops. And depending on what I'm going to grow, I might even sprinkle in a slow-release organic fertilizer um, at planting time, too. And I do love cover crops. As a, as a gardener, I find it hard to give up that space for like six I or eight know, weeks right? for a cover crop. It's hard. <laughs> but I, I do, if, if there's a bed I have that's not doing as well as I think it should, or the soil's not looking as good as I'd like, I will plant some buckwheat. You know, give it five or six weeks of growth dig it under, let that decompose for a couple of weeks, then I'll replant it. And I'm always glad I did because you really can tell the difference. Um, but it is hard to do sometimes. But that is something I do in my cold frames especially. Once um, all those early spring crops come out, uh, you know, and, and they're kind of fallow for the summer until I plant winter carrots in late July, for those, you know, six or eight weeks, I will put in a cover crop just to build up the soil too. Right. Um you know, it seems uh, one of the big epiphanies I had about succession sowing, uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but was that one of the things that I felt the most excited that I finally had that aha and made more than one sowing of was basil. You know, because the basil would get kind of woody and shrubby and it would all be going to flower and I'd be pinching and pinching and pinching the, the flower heads from my earlier basil by the time my tomatoes were coming in. And yeah. it was like such an aha, and I feel like basil is something that, again, that we could um, sow a lot more often. Do you do that? I, I do at least two, and, you know, I'm obsessed with basil. There's so many incredible varieties, yeah. especially recently. A lot of them are more, you know, resistant to downy mildew. A lot of them are, um, they really delay bolting. Um, but I do usually two. So I've got some transplants now that are four inches tall under my grow lights that are ready to go in the garden uh, shortly. I'll probably put some in the polytunnel, too, of course. And then I'll start some more. So then I'll plant those, usually early July in the garden, and they will take me into, like, the frost dates, into late September, early October, so that we do always have high-quality basil. Um, because when it gets woody, when it bolts, the flavor changes. And it's amazing how many gardeners I talk to who are nervous about pinching and using their, their homemade yes. homegrown herbs because they don't want to take them all up. You know, but I, I think basil is one of those herbs. The more you pinch, the more you get. So I really encourage gardeners novice gardeners especially, to harvest their herbs often. If you end up taking too much and the plant dies, which is something I've never seen happen, but if, if that happens, you can have another plant. Get yeah. another one and start again, but at least you've used your basil. You don't want to wait till the end of summer when it doesn't taste as good. So use it all summer long so you get that maximum flavor. Um, and have you tried the new Everleaf variety yet? No. Mm -mm. It is. Uh, I've grown it three years in a row now. Um, it is mildew resistant, but for me, the main thing is it... it doesn't start to flower until about seven or eight weeks later than typical Genovese. Oh, interesting. Type okay. Oh, great. Yeah, it's very compact, 15 inches tall. It has really short nodes, so it's not a great one for like a market gardener who wants big bunches of basil because it, it has all these short little branches. But for a home gardener, it is really an outstanding variety. So, of course, we've almost used up our time. We have barely a minute left, and I just want to ask you to put in a good word for one of the other benefits of succession sowing having to do with food waste and, and the reduction of that, yes? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if you're planting up, as we mentioned earlier, a long row or a big bed full of one type of crop um, that's all ready at the same time and you can't eat it all at the same time, whether it's radishes or beets or turnips or lettuce or broccoli, then you're wasting food. And, and for me, that's one of the things I try never do to do because we all know how uh, serious problem food waste is. So uh, planting these small successive batches of vegetables, one after the other, with different maturity dates, however you practice succession planting, it will reduce your food waste, um, which is really important. And if, you know, I can't always plan perfectly. It doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes there's a bumper crop of something 
something. And when I do have extra food, if it doesn't get frozen, you know, or preserved some way, then it goes to our local food bank. Yeah. So again, we're not wasting food, and they always are happy to get homegrown herbs and vegetables, of course. Well, Nikki Chabor, um, thank you so much. And again, congratulations on your recent American Horticultural Society Book Award for Veggie Garden Remix. And I hope I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Margaret, and happy gardening. Thanks. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. And I hope I'll talk to all the rest of you again soon, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or at Facebook or Instagram as at Away to Garden. And like Nikki said, happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.